Hello. In this video, let's take a look at one of the basic building blocks that will help us design our food delivery system and something that we will require for deploying all our resources in AWS, Virtual Private Cloud, otherwise known as VPC. Let's take a look at Virtual Private Cloud, otherwise known as VPC. And this is what let's talk about what this video is about. This video is about the food delivery system that we're gonna create and we're gonna build a basic building block for that system to work, which is a VPC. What, what this video is not is about a thorough review of all the features that are available inside the VPC service and how we can use them. I'm gonna create another video for that. Please look out for that. So here, what we're gonna do is I'm gonna go over this infrastructure as code service that I put together, which is a VPC module in Terraform for all the AWS resources that you would need to create a VPC and make it function. So in this module, when you do an execute, it will create all the resources needed and then in, inside the VPC and make it functional. So over here, there are a couple of things that would eventually in other videos we'll try and fix or, or, or revisit. As an example is over here, I'm using environment variables as an export. We can we are better off served by using a rule as against using environment variables and running it in a CI CD system. And we'll uh, go ahead and execute that in the future. But for now, this is a very functional uh, module that can be used out of the box. So in this case, what I have done is I've made a couple of assumptions here and I have made a couple of uh, decisions that would that would that would put a VPC together and make it look and make it function as one if we decide to deploy multiple VPCs using the same code. So one of the thing is that it has very limited inputs. If you see it has these many inputs, it's like five or six inputs, three or four of them are required, which is like you need to give a cider block, you need to give whether you need to enable these or not. I think these are not required. Region is one of the required uh, resources subnets are something that is required. So there's very limited inputs that are required. And once you have gone through that, uh, the, uh, provided all that input, it creates all the resources that are required. It creates the elastic IPs, it creates in, uh, internet gateways, it creates NAT gateways and associates the elastic IPs with it. it, creates all the routes, it creates all the route tables, and it creates the VPC itself and some of the other uh, uh, resources along with it. So let's go over what this module creates and what to expect as, an, as our basic building block for this series, right? So this is one of the architecture diagrams that I have created for this module. I call it Network Design Overview. And we'll go over when you execute the module, what, what's to expect and what does it create? So over here, we see an AWS account, we create an VPC in it. And one of the assumptions that this module or this resource, uh, this repo has made it creates three availability zones. And that is uh, one of the recommendations by AWS and says, okay, you have to have three availability zones for high availability and have your infrastructure and resources split across three. Right? So, and I have gone through well, some of the regions, all, almost all the regions in, in AWS, almost all of them, if not if not a few, have three availability zones. So this module should get us going in all the, all the all the very famous research regions that are available and in, in use at the moment. Right? So here, what we do is we create three availability zones and we create subnets. And the way we do it is we create three public subnets, which are distributed in three zones. And then at that point, the choice is for the user to use that, that module and decide if they want to use, create multiple private subnets from that point. In this case, I'm making a web or an application subnet where all my containers and my serverless code is supposed to be residing, and I'm creating a separate set of subnets for databases. And if you look at the example for this resource here that we talked about, I have given an example here where we can try and create another set of subnets. As long as the CIDR block input that we provide is able to accommodate those many subnets at that, that level of uh, split on its on its own uh, master network, we should be able to add more networks, private networks, and that should not be a problem. So here I have added uh, the way to create another set of subnets. I call it Bastion subnets. If you want to run workloads as an admin workload or some something like that, 
I've used uh, Terraform resources like like uh, some of the functions to to try and uh, create all the of uh, try and identify and what the subnet is going to look like for each of these resources and then create it as well as against to putting that as an input and providing that value. So new bits is one of the resources that is being used for one of the functions. And AZ is the availability zone that we want that created in. So that is being tied down so that all the all the subnets or all the all the subnets are created in the right AZs and we have definitions of what the subnet size guys is going to look like as well. This is where we define all that. And that schema is kind of enforced on the input variable itself. That's something that is listed over here. So if we go back to our design overview. So we see here that we have an internet gateway that we create, and then we associate a route table with that internet gateway. And all the traffic on the public subnets has a route that says, okay, everything from the subnet has to be directed and routed to the internet gateway. So that way all our public subnet and public traffic is directly available on the internet and it can connect to the internet. So apart from that, as we discussed that we have made a decision that we are going to make the rest of the subnets private here. So we have the web subnet or the application set of subnets and we have the database subnets as we discussed. All of them are private. The way to do that is I'm trying to go over that now. So we have NAT gateways that we have created as a part of this module and we have elastic IPs that are associated with the NAT gateways as well. We'll go in depth for the whole module and we'll, we'll go over the code as well. To, to identify how that is done and, and what are the choices that have been made to make that happen. So for now we can go over like we create elastic IPs that are public IP addresses that we can ask a request AWS to provide us. And then we associate that with the NAT gateways. And in this case, what we have done is we have created three NAT gateways for three availability zones. And then we have created route tables for all those NAT, all those availability zones. Outside, uh, aside from the route table that we have created for the public subnet. So all the public subnets are routing traffic to the through that public route table that we see over here. And all these individual route tables for each AZs, all they do is the local subnet in availability zone A, as an example, will route its traffic only to NAT gateway in that availability zone. So web subnet in availability zone A will route its traffic to NAT gateway in, a, in AZ A or availability zone A. Same goes with database subnets. If they in 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 availability zone A, the database subnet in A will route it tra route its traffic to NAT gateway in availability zone A. And the route route table is configured and designed to to make sure that traffic routing happens. If, if we ended up creating the bastion subnet that we saw in this example, we would also add the same. We'll add another route table entry and add a route that says, okay, everything in Bastion subnet for availability zone B as an example, will go to route table or will go to NAT gateway in AZB. So that way we have kind of restricted and trimmed down our uh, VPC and all the networks so that it is more streamlined and it can work out of the box as well. Why create a module for, for basics, basic resources like these and why not directly start coding? So one of the things that we want to do is we're trying to make a scalable solution. We're trying to make a solution that can be tiered in its offering as well. So some of these building blocks are kind of very essential to make sure that we can start building on top of that. What does that mean as an example? Right? Now in this food order system that we saw here, we are going to use our data store as Amazon S3. Amazon S3 is a service that is available over the internet. Right? So if you wanted to use a, uh, uh, an S3 bucket, as long as our application or our role or our user has access to that S3 bucket, we are able to make a call. That's how we will set it up. We can set it up as a public bucket as well. That's not necessarily what we would want in this use case. So to make sure that happens, what we will have to do is our traffic traverses out. Over here, our traffic will traverse out the NAT gateway and it will go out the internet and it will come back to connect to an S3 bucket, which is basically like adding more hops to our route and it's an expensive thing as well. It costs money every time you have your traffic route through that. Another way to do it is to add an S3, S3 endpoint, a VPC endpoint for S3 service. Using that endpoint, or uh, you can have the traffic routed directly to the service from inside the VPC as against to having it traverse the internet. That reduces the hops and the costs as well. 
Now, if we decide to add a service like that, we'll probably create another module very similar to the VPC module that we saw here. Very similar to a VPC module using Terraform as infrastructure as code service, we'll create another one like that. If we, if and when we do that, we'll be able to, easily able to tie it together. And let's say this real becomes a real offering, and we want to create this offering and make it available in Australia, and make it available in the United States, and make it available in some other regions. And if we decide to do that, and if we want to do that, we just have to keep running all these modules in a certain order. As an example over here, we have created multiple modules inside this VPC solution. So we there's a, there's a reason that it has to be executed not really as one resource because of some other times and some of the some of the code, some of the coding that has been done inside. So we create multiple modules and then keep executing it. Very similar to that, we can create an S3 endpoint module and just append it and say, okay, now we want to add an S3 endpoint to this VPC in all our regions and all our all our uh, offerings all across the globe. And we are going to be able to do that. So that's the reason why we want to start coding and adding infrastructure as code. And in future iterations, add CI CD for all our offerings as here as there as well, and not directly really start writing our application services. So we'll keep building on that and we'll keep reviewing it. And one of the things that we'll eventually do is go over this code and see why we have written some of these files that we have here. And as an example, Terraform Docs. What do we do? How do we generate our documentation? We'll go over that as well. It's a great way to, to maintain a module and its documentation and its, its usability for other people if they want to use it. So that is something that we'll go over in another video and go over this whole code and all the modules in detail. But this is more like a network architecture overview of the VPC and how it's supposed, how it's supposed to be deployed and what to expect from this module. And I hope you like this video. And in the future, if you want to watch more videos like these, please like and subscribe to this channel. And I hope you have a wonderful day. Thank you.